are you? It is so good to see everyone. Welcome a little bit early, typically on Fridays. Um, you would see me on at, at seven o'clock. Give me a second. I'm doing several things, but I have a very special guest that, well, when you have these opportunities to someone who has such a schedule as our guest, you take advantage as you can. So I would like to introduce everyone to Reverend Dr. Tony. How are you doing? I am doing very well. Thank you. And hello, everyone who is watching. Yes, uh, let's see here. Well, it's growing. Um, already, it's amazing. Um, got, yeah, and I've seen the counter going up. So anyway, so Tony, um, you and I, I guess I reached out to you about, I don't know, maybe a month ago. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, listeners um, actually suggested that I invite you on. And when I found your website, and by the way, all of your contact information for everyone here is in the description. Um, I was quite taken aback. And if I may, I'm actually going to uh, go to your website. And I'm going to, basically, this is what folks brought me to ask Tony to come on. And I'm just going to read this to you. It's, it, if it's difficult for you to recognize yourself as I am, know that it will come through your detachment from human beliefs. You are the source, all that is, the ineffable. There is no halfway measures here. By source, we mean the consciousness awareness that always exists with or without created worlds and dimensions. The I am sourcing itself as creator. I have to tell you, that is such a strong resonance, Tony, that I said, I have to have you on. <laughs> so um, how did you come to this discovery? Uh, it, blew, it blows me away. I just got to tell you, it is so complete. And I think it is an answer to much of the journey that I'm on. Uh, the, the whole idea that it is us. Exactly. And I always tell people I cheated. I, <laughs> I love here. that honesty. <laughs> I came here remembering. <laughs> now that, that is interesting. That does give you a slight advantage. It, it did, so to speak. I mean, from an adult standpoint, we can say that. But from a child standpoint, it was a little bit um, off-putting, if you would, from the standpoint of not being able to talk to anybody about what I knew or realized or was aware of. And my father was killed when I was five. Um, we lived in Reno, Nevada. He was getting ready to run for uh, governor. Very well known, loved man, just so loved in the community. And my mother came in and said to me, um, your father is gone. He's gone to heaven. He will not be back. You are the father now. And I remember thinking to myself in my little five-year-old mind, ah, now it begins. And I took that role in the family, not from the standpoint of being her husband, but of being the father, you know, taking out the garbage, mowing the lawn, doing all the things that dad does. So I never really had like a childhood, which was actually helpful because the other side of that was my world of remembering. So it was more like I was here doing the tasks I came to do for dad, and at the same time remembering where I came from. I was raised as a Catholic, went to Catholic school, and spent most of my recess time, lunchtime, in church, because that was the only place to be, excuse me. <clears throat> By the time I got into high school, I had decided to become a cloistered Carmelite nun. And the Carmelites, and along with a lot of other nuns in the Catholic Church, you said you were Christian. Were you Catholic or Christian? My mother, uh, digress very quickly, sure. parents got divorced. Anyway, when she came to visit uh, my brother and I, she snuck me out and got me baptized as a Catholic. Oh, and okay. so, but uh, prior, after that, it was primary Protestant. So, okay. uh, yeah. Okay. So, if I 
teen years, I just decided, you know, I would be a Carmelite. And the Carmelites, along with other um, organizations, you go behind the wall, you go behind the veil, you don't see the world again. You don't see the, you don't see public again. You don't, and if you're, the only people who can really come to visit you are your family. And I'm assuming it's still this way. I mean, that was- That's a time. real, is it a cloister? Is that what they call it's that? A yeah, it's a cloister. Yeah. And there's like the Carthusians, they're cloist, they're, they have a cloistered section. I mean, there's, there's different organizations within the church that have cloisters. So that was my intention. And during this period of time, I was be, making friends with the English teacher in our school who was also the um, prior of the monastery of, of the monks that were teaching us. And it turned out he would come over to our house for, for dinner with one of his uh, other brothers because they always travel in pairs. And we would say the rosary together. And um, that was my understanding of him. Well, it turned out that there were other things going on with other girls in the school. And I'm not going to go into that, but you can. One's imagination can easily lead to that. And I understand. Yes. Well, once that was discovered, everyone who was friends with this person was told that they could either finish school there without, I was on the honor roll. I was the head of the religious organization in the school. I could, I could do that. I could, I could stay there without any of my honors, without any of, of my roles, just as a student, or I could leave. So I left. And when I left, I was going to be a senior that year. So it was my last year of high school. I also left the church because it so devastated my belief in what I had been taught that I said, okay, that none of this is real, which was a blessing. Because yeah. I finished high school, I went to business college, I got my degree, and I moved to San Francisco and lived in San Francisco during the time of the flower children. I moved to San Francisco in 66. Far out. So, and I wasn't like a hippie on the street and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, while I was in San Francisco then, because we're always leading ourselves, uh, the, the divine in us is always leading us exactly what is next, next, next. I met the Holy Order of Mans, which is no longer in existence. And at the time, it was just starting to become an, organ a nas an international organization. The premise of the Holy Order was Catholicism and Eastern mysticism mixed together. So we had Mass and Communion and we had meditation. It was perfect. That so is I most interesting. The teacher who had started this, who's now deceased, and he and I just became fast friends. Here was a person who understood everything I said and said, basically, I can take you farther if you want to go farther. And I said, I'm here. So I stayed there for almost two years. And at the end of that time, I knew it was done. It was finished. And it was time for me to go out and teach on my own. And so that's what I did. So that's kind of the long short of it. In the process of it all, of course, there's also living life, getting married, having children, and doing all the things that people do. So I've always been teaching like on weekends or at night until 1996. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna step out of the bureaucratic world. I worked as a finance manager. I worked as a paralegal. I, had, I was really into the world of business, which has served me well. And yeah. just started Sacred Spaces, my own company, and started teaching full-time. So that's how I came to where I am. Um, somebody once asked me in an interview, okay, you say you remember the other side. You, rem you remember where you came from. What's it like? And I thought, wow, no one has ever asked me that question before. Wow, what word will I use to describe it? So I thought about it for a while and I said, okay, can you imagine a realm in which there is absolutely no judgment of any kind? That's the closest I can come to an explanation. And it's hard for our minds to take that on, to, because everything here is so dual. Mm -hmm. Right, wrong, black, white, up, down, yep. good, bad. A place where none of that exists. The, is, the isness is, and that's all that is there. When we can come to that right, arrive to that place in ourselves here now, then we reach that freedom, that peace that surpasses all understanding. 
So it can be an easy journey, it can be a hard journey, and it's everybody's choice, dependent upon where they're coming from and what they've been taught. One of the things that I have discovered in my journey is that, and it came to quite as a revelation, it really did, one of those epiphanies, yeah. that the journey is really about me. Yes. When it comes right down to it, I, I was the one who, and I have a theory, Tony, that uh, states that what makes us unique in these flesh bodies is that each and every person that went through the rite of initiation of the birth passage makes us very special and unique, of, particularly when we, and this is my belief, that we're born into the death cycle mm -hmm. and we die back into the birth process. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what I came too, and people sometimes want to know, you know, as you and I were talking earlier, well, where's your position? You know, what are you? Since you're not a Christian, then what are you? I've told them I've rejected all the world gods because I don't like any of them. Yeah. I haven't met one that I, and that's the problem. I haven't met one that I could actually say that I like. But here's the point, is that when it really comes down to this, I'm the one experiencing this, not you. Yeah. Not any of the rest of us. Right. Yeah. It's, it's always an individual journey. And one of the things that happens for almost all my students, and so I'm sure they're a representative of most of the population, is that there's a, a comparison that goes on or a wish that they could be like someone else or strive to become more like this person or that person, not realizing that each of those people they're trying to be like is going through their own journey in their own way, yeah. having all of their own little ups and downs and whatever comes up in their life. And that the person who's the individual, just like you were saying, it is absolutely their process that they want to pay attention to. Often people will say to me, in fact, it happened yesterday with a student, she said, well, isn't that really selfish? And I said, what is wrong with being selfish? Selfish has a connotation because of the dictionary's definition. But when you focus upon yourself first, then you have something to give. If you don't focus on yourself first, you're going to try and get something from a person, an organization, a workshop, whatever, because I you're have, not feeding yourself. I have a very wise man who lives in India who writes me. And I told him, I said, I said, well, I'm looking to form this unity of our species, Homo sapiens sapiens. And he wrote back, he said, it will never happen. And here's why. He said, it's the individual's destiny to fight to survive. Mm -hmm. And he said, that will always be a stumbling block when our species comes together, because in the end, it's about my survival more than yours. Mm -hmm. And that happens with a lot of people. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to accept that and see that. One of the things that I find and I run into a lot is a lot of the new age terminology that, well, well really well-meaning, is misused because the new age idea was a great idea originally, but it got to be all about unicorns, rainbows, and, you know, fairies. <laughs> well, it is. It's all, it and, and, and the word that I always get a kick out of is I want to be in the oneness. I want to know the oneness. Yeah. And I like to remind people that speaking of surviving, the oneness includes all the murders and rapes that are going on right now, the wars in the mid East, whether or not you like our president, it's everything that is the oneness. Is that where you really want to be because you're already there rather than idea of the oneness being a choir of angels singing somewhere and everyone's sitting around playing their harp. It's, it's much more a realization that we're a part of all of this. And as an individual, we have an opportunity 
to bring whatever message we feel we have into the world. And that's why I started the Angelic Human site, because angel means messenger. The Sacred Spaces site is my main site, but I've got four other offshoots. And angel means messenger. The word human, hue is an ancient, ancient form of the word God. Man is homo sapien, as you were saying. So you've got source and form with a message. And we all have a message. Ev absolutely everybody here has a message of some kind. And I don't mean a message where they have to get on Zoom and YouTube and give the yeah. message. Yeah. Just whatever it is. Maybe it is the perfect way to scrub a kitchen floor. And it may be a message to just one. Pardon? It may be a message to just one other be. person. Exactly. Exactly. So I do spiritual readings where I talk about the person's message. I look into their soul record, which is like their own personal Akashic field where all of their experiences are to see what their message is here. And I talk about that in, in the reading so that people have an opportunity to stop thinking that I'm not as good as somebody else or I wish I was like so-and-so because everybody's message is perfect. Ooh, I like that. You know, that I can resonate with. Everyone's message is perfect. You know, when you're describing this, this is what got me once, as I told you, that I, I awoke. Mm -hmm. I was realizing I was trying to get into a room that I was already in, and I held the keys. Right. I mean, <laughs> it's like I, I literally woke up in bed one night and said, Steiger, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, good for you. Yeah. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> no, that, that's fine. That's that's wonderful because people, then someone might say to you, "Well, Wayne, so you just you were enlightened in that moment." Well, in fact, I, I was asked about this yesterday too by the same student. When, when did you know your enlightenment? And I said, "When?" I said, "There's not a moment. There's mm. a moment in that moment that you cognitively understand it, but think of all of the experiences you have to have." the places you go, the people you see, everything is leading to that. So it's the whole process and not just this life, but all your lives. And, in, and then in that moment in bed that night, it comes to a culmination and you say, ah, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a piece of everything that's happened. Yes. Yeah. Now you, you said something to the oneness. I think that, and here, here's just my personal opinion that what I've seen in the metaphysical community and the spiritual community is that they they have built a religion to replace the one that they've walked out of. I agree. And again, it's the same maze that I see them walking into. The oneness. Now, people like to, they, they hammer me all the time because what I keep telling them is that they've got to get to a place where you have to understand you've got to get out of this dualism this good and evil thinking. There is a place, Tony, that I believe exists where it's not about good or evil. It's just about. Yeah. And oneness, getting back to that point, means the good and the bad. Yes, it does. Because there really isn't any good and bad. Now, everybody, up in arms, go. There I go. I mean, the letters, you know, save the emails. No. <laughs> you don't know why something is happening. You have no idea. And I'm not saying that we need more wars or more murders or anything. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is we don't know why that is occurring. My best example of this was years ago when a friend of mine, a psychologist, said to me, I need to talk to you. Would you like to coffee with me? I don't have anybody to talk to about a subject that you'll understand. So I said, sure. Off we go. He told me a story about a young lady that he was seeing and treating um, for drug dependency. And he said, I just, I can't get her straight. I can't get her to, to stop. And she's just in her teens. And he asked me if I had any idea about what she said to him when he went to visit her the last time, which was, he asked her if there was anything he could do to just get her to stop. You know, how is he failing her? And she said, I came to this earth to assist youngsters who are addicted to drugs. How will I ever do that if I don't know what it feels like myself? Wow. 
Yeah. And that's the best example. And he said, I had no answer for her. And I said, well, there isn't an answer. She gave you the answer. I don't have anything to tell you. And if you take that small example and you apply it to anything else, we don't know. And people have said to me, well, what about little babies being raped? Okay, sounds very ugly. But that baby you're looking at is source. It is an entire being in a baby body. It's not a baby. That's just the form. We don't know what's going on. Doesn't mean we should have more of it. All I'm saying is we don't know. And if we, we admit that we don't know and stay out of judgment, then we can begin to reflect more on our own self. It's so easy to just look out there and say, well, this is wrong and that's wrong. And this should change and that should change rather than looking within. Totally agree. Is there. I have said many times that the problem with that I have seen is that for myself, I've been on my own since I was 15 years old. And um, I got to tell you, I loved it. <laughs> At 15, growing up on the streets of Houston, Texas, in the Montrose area, um, I began to get exposed to different cultures, different ways of thinking, uh, was introduced to LSD and uh, was, a, was an avid user of LSD, was actually in a government-sponsored program mm -hmm. that taught us how to meditate, how to astral project while on LSD. Mm -hmm. And those experiences, Tony, led me to understand that there is life within life within life. Yeah. Now, I was a youngster, uh, mm -hmm. was very young, but again, it wasn't a path of destruction for me. It no. was a path of learning. Right. And I love how what she said. How else can I reach out to them? Right. Yeah. If I, if I don't know what it, what it feels like. Yeah. And that's the beauty of some of the experiences we have, is that the things that feel so detrimental or bad or dark or whatever people want to call it, or like fertilizer that nurtures our compassion, our understanding, and our ability to be present with our message, whatever it is, and bring it to the world without having to find it on page 12 of the book. It's our own realization. And that's really the only experience that is of any worth. Books are great. They yeah. say all kinds of things. I love to read. But it isn't until you have the experience yourself that you truly understand what it feels like, whatever that experience may be. You know what I've come to understand? Through the life, through all those um, who hurt me, and, you know, it goes from my father, and uh, it was, you know, pretty rough growing up as a child. Um, you know, it was literally almost, he almost beat me to death. But here's the point. Through those experiences, I was learning. Mm -hmm. And here is that when I almost lost my life, I contracted Lyme disease with bacterial meningitis. Mm -hmm. um, I came out of that coma, and the thing that hit me was forgiveness. Yeah. And I don't know what happened while I was in that coma. Um, I, I know that uh, from what the doctor said, but this is what I learned, Tony. I came out of that and I found that forgiveness was very easy. Mm -hmm. And the first one I went to was my father okay. and addressed him. And, you know, I'll never forget this. As I told him, I said, you know, I love you. I said, I understand now what your conflict was when I was a child. You were dealing with a great deal of stress and conflict. I was an outlet for that. And I said, you know, I said, and I hugged him. I said, I love you. Well, he, come to find out, uh, had all these years regretted that. And mm -hmm. so there was a healing oh, yeah. and a bonding. Yes. And I think that what most people don't realize in life, the reason today so many people are angry, Tony, is that I feel 
that they have lost their identity of who they are. And this is your message that I find that we are the I am. Yes, that, that is what we are. And it's difficult for the mind to understand it. So I want to put this caveat out there. Your mind will never understand it fully. The awareness of the I am aware of itself is what you will come to. The mind will still do whatever the mind does. But the awareness itself will be on top, if you would, of whatever the conjectures are of the mind. And in that awareness, that doesn't mean that you have to go around and agree with everybody or say yes to everything or any of those other ideas that come up. It is simply being aware that what is happening in each moment is the I am expressing itself through each individual form, through each individual experience in life. And to allow that to be how it is without judging it as right or wrong, good or bad. Oh. On my Sacred Spaces website, fourth item down, I think. It is, I is, think. Is the <laughs> absolution ritual that I created to, assist, and it's just free for anybody to go and use. It's there in text, audio, and video format. For people to absolve themselves of wrongdoing. Okay, is it? Yeah, one, two, three, four. Home, I guess to you, monthly special yep. absolution. Okay. Let's hit over there. Okay, let me click on that. So in the absolution ritual, what you are doing is absolving yourself of any wrongdoing, absolving the other person of any wrongdoing, and then the two of you absolved of any wrongdoing in the light, absolve the world together. So there is, and I just think of it as one step further than forgiveness, because forgiveness says something happened that I think is wrong, and I forgive you for that. Okay. But if you say nothing happened that was wrong, it's just an experience that we are having together, then you absolve it. You put it back into solution. So I like to say you absolve, to dissolve, to resolve. That is wonderful. And you put it all I'm going to think on this one for a while. Okay. The very act of forgiveness is, in fact, a, I love that, the, the awareness that you're bringing to my consciousness is, is there's yet a higher plane that says, now, wait a minute, you're right. Forgiveness says that there's been a wrong done here right. that needs absolution for. Wow. And how, I'll show you how powerful this is. I did a workshop back east years ago, and I'm now living on an island, so I don't travel as much. And the beautiful divine internet makes all of this that was <laughs> possible. I have students in places I would never visit. I'm not going to be running off to South Africa in any quick moment, but I have students there. And when I was traveling, when I was living on the mainland and I was traveling all the time, I did a workshop back East and we were all sitting in a circle. There were probably about 45 people in the room. And I said, I'm going to lead you through the absolution ritual. And I had explained it. So I'm going to give you a minute. I'm just going to be quiet. I'll give you a minute to choose who you want to absolve or the situation you want to absolve, whatever it is. So we waited and I started the absolution ritual. And in the middle of the ritual, one of the people in the circles phone rang because she hadn't turned her phone off. And I just ignored it. And I went on and we finished. And after everybody had a chance to kind of get assembled, she said, I have to say something. And she was looking at her phone. She says, that phone call was the person I was absolving. I haven't talked to this man in two years. <laughs> uh-huh. Talk about oneness. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it was amazing. I love it. So if you, everyone who's listening, if you have any uh, person or experience in your life that you just really wish you could let go of. I could just stop thinking about this. Use the absolution ritual. And if it doesn't completely take care of it the first time, do it every day until it does. I guarantee it will. 
just be steadfast in it. I personally absolve everything. If I op open up the lettuce and you know I, there's some rotten leaves in there that should have been cleaned by the produce guy, I absolve that. I just, yeah. I just absolve constantly so that this, it's flowing. This is this is outstanding, Tony. This really is. And I and when I introduced Tony, by the way, I said. Reverend Doctor, you want to explain that because I think that people need to know that you do have a PhD and you do uh, have the uh, doctor. I mean, the, this ministry as well, right? Yes, I have a PhD in metaphysics, and I'm also a, me a metaphysical minister. And when I was in the Holy Order, I became a priest and master teacher. And um, so the Reverend Doctor covers all of that. And as I explained to you earlier, um, calling me Tony is fine. I like to use the titles, not because I need titles, but because it helps people understand that there is something behind this face they're looking at. Yeah. Usually most needed when a student of mine is trying to describe the work they're doing with me to their family, their friends, and, and they're being challenged by the, the other person. Mm -hmm. And to be able to say, well, this is who this person is, and this is what she knows, et cetera, assists them. So even though I remembered everything, I realized as I grew older that that isn't enough. There has to be, for the public, there has to be something that the public can hang their hat on. Yeah. It's, it's too difficult f for the world to understand just somebody came here and remembers. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? That? Yeah. Remember what? <laughs> Remember what? Yeah, exactly. So um, I just invite everybody to use this absolution, rit absolution ritual. And um, as Wayne said, I assume my, I didn't look at the description. I assume my website is in. It is all up there. Yes, your books as well. Okay, great. Now. Um, go ahead. Well, you see. I don't know. You know, there has been, as I explained, my wife will tell you this in detail. You know, she said, you know, if there's anything to a person changing, metamorphosizing um, mm -hmm. in their walk in life, she says you would be the epitome of that, 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 you know, something begins to transform within us. Yes. And I've been struggling to try to understand why it seems that our current world today there's just a lot of angry people, just a lot of angry people. I've talked to people who um, get very short sometimes in the grocery store and, you know, you can't even approach them. Mm -hmm. So this begins to give a whole different approach to that. It does. And, it's, and especially when you realize that anger has one message, something needs to change. And, the first thing that the human mind thinks is, right, you're sure right. He does need to change. He <laughs> needs to change in you. <laughs> Fifth grade teacher, she says, I always remember, you want to have one finger pointing at someone, there's three more pointing back at you. <laughs> Something needs to change in you, not so that you will condone another person's actions that you deem harmful or any of the other things that the mind starts playing with, but so that you can stay in a space that's neutral. And that's really where I end up in all of my classes is teaching people how to arrive at a state of neutrality because source is neutrally beneficent. Source neutrally benefits all, which is so scary to the human mind because everybody wants God to care about them and yeah. be the father. And, you know, I, I'll just give it to God. You're actually giving it to yourself. Yeah. And when you realize that coming to a, a place of neutrality doesn't mean you have to like it. Doesn't have to mean you say yes. It simply means you are neutral about it. You can walk away, be neutral. Then that anger begins to dissipate. The anger is an attempting to change something externally that you can't change. All you can do is change yourself and the way you're seeing it. Because our beliefs create our perception. Yes. Everybody's reality is relative. I love those words, real, reality and relative. They all have the same roots. Mm -hmm. And the reality that each person has is relative to what they believe is true. 
there's a wonderful story that I read in a women's magazine that's now all over the internet. I, I went to see if I could find the source of it, but it's there in a whole bunch of different forms. So if anybody wants to look it up, they can. And the story is about this guy who wanted to help his wife fix Easter dinner. Everybody was coming, the whole family, and they had lots of relatives, lots of generations going to be represented. So she said, sure, you can help me. What do you want to do? And he said, I want to cook the ham. And she said, you can't cook the ham. You don't know how to cook a ham. He said, well, of course. You turn the oven on, you put the oven in, the ham in the oven, and then you cook it until it's done. So she said, see, I knew. I knew you didn't know. You have to cut the ends off the ham. And he said, you do? And she goes, yes, I'll do the ham. So he thought, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. So Easter dinner comes and his wife's mother is there. And he says to the wife's mother, did you teach your daughter to cut the ends off the ham before cooking a ham? And she goes, well, of course, that's how you cook a ham. And he went, oh, okay. Well, the wife's mother's mother was there. So he says to grandmama, did you teach your daughter to cut the ends off the ham? And she said, oh, sweetie, honey. Teacher, I didn't teach her anything. I had to cut the ends off the ham because I didn't have a pan big enough for it to fit in. <laughs> and it became doctrine. <laughs> it became you believe from what toothpaste you use to what you think you <laughs> and apply that and you will find someone trying to control a certain aspect of the population. <laughs> Always for money, power. Yeah. Always for the power, the money involved, if there's money involved. If there isn't money involved, it's always for power. Power over the ham, power over the dinner, controlling it. It's for control. Power over the individual. Exactly. Yeah. Any belief that you have, and I invite everyone to look at their beliefs, that does not say, I am divine. Any belief that does not say that is up for examination. Of what good is it to you? Why are you holding on to it? What safety net is it providing? Good, 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 good points. All of this. Well, that's the foundation of all religion. Yes. Um, you know, I uh, have a radio show I do every Thursday night. And, you know, last night we, we, I broke the myth of Lucifer and Satan. You know, the whole mind trap that you get into. And I said, the reason why we adapt to it so quickly is that it gives us an excuse. Mm -hmm. It means that I don't have to take personal responsibility. There's something greater than me right. that's happening. And because of that, uh, I take a secondary role. And I keep saying, but wait a minute. This is about my journey, not about some made-up character <laughs> called Satan or Lucifer. And then, then the next thing you know, well, it's the devil's fault. And, you know, the next thing you know, we're back into this duality again. There was a wonderful author who passed away in 2010 named Lawrence Gardner. And he has written many books, very well-known um, was made an, an, a night or whatever in the, in the UK, just very, very famous. I love his books because what he does is he takes the etymology of the language for all of this, and he does a lot of research into archaeological finds and things of this nature. And he says, where did the word come from? What is it meaning? It doesn't make any difference how we're using it now. What did it originally mean? Yeah. The word Satan was actually the Satan who tested the people in the temple who were there to learn. And the Satan tested you, or the Satan tested you. So they say, Satan is testing me. Well, okay, you're using the right etymology of the word. <laughs> it has nothing and, to do with a being anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I love this. because religious teaching. It is. And I think that once I broke free of that, you know, but it's, it's how our species, particularly in this modern day, I mean, I grew up, I was born in 1955, and so I grew up in the era of science fiction. Lon <laughs> Chaney, Boris Karloff, you know, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. And so as a child, I was more particularly drawn to the science fiction because flying saucers were everywhere. Yeah. But I had, Tony, this affinity for them. 
there was something that as I little taught, I was drawn to this. My, my grandmother couldn't pull me away. And I remember seeing Alan Shepard go up mm-hmm. in the first Mercury 3. So that's telling you a little bit of how old I am. But, you know, yeah. Uh, and come to find out, I think that there was a purpose for that. Of course, there always is. And it, and it takes us in the direction that we usually prefer to go. If you're going in a direction that you don't prefer to go in and you're saying, I don't want my life to be like this, I always tell my students, sit down and ask yourself why it's happening. Because people ask me all the time, well, okay, do, do things happen to you that you don't like? Do things happen that upset you? Yeah, I, well, of course, I'm in a human body. <laughs> the first thing I do is I go and I sit down, no matter what I'm doing. I go and I sit down and I just sit with it and say, okay, why is this here? Where did it come from? What's it showing me? And I just sit with it until I come up with an answer. And the more you do it, the faster it ha- you come up with the answer because you get to know yourself really well. And of course, all the things that are obvious are going to happen first. The things uh-huh. that are on the surface. It's when you get down into the very core with all those little nitty gritty pieces that you really get to see yourself. And realize, oh, well, yeah, of course, I don't need to believe this anymore. This isn't serving me anymore. Why do I think this is important? And then you can come back to this neutral place. Yeah, yeah. You know, as as you were talking, I keep thinking that this is the type of teaching. Uh, By the way, what's your view on karma? You know, I don't believe that karma is. I am right there with you. I, I just said, Here's the thing, and I reached this epiphany just last week. Again, typically it hits me about 3 o'clock or 3.30, but it hit me that the fact that karma in itself is defined to me as insanity. (laughs) That's beautiful. (laughs) And and I'm serious. This is what I wrote down on my pad. I've been practicing lucid dreaming, and... (laughs) um, the thing that came to me was that I saw this hamster on this wheel Mm -hmm. and the hamster's trying to get to the door. It can't get to the door because it's running on the wheel. Right. And that's karma. It's in, yeah, it's insanity. Uh, At some point in time, it has to stop because what I know is that this planet like other living planets in this galaxy, in this universe, will have an end to its life. Mm -hmm. It will move on to something else. And so this whole thing that where you bring everything based on your religion, based on your theology, your doctrine, on this planet, at some point in time, that becomes null and void. Then what do you do? You know, it's like I asked this person the other day. I said, you know, everyone goes around chasing ghosts and, you know, spirits. And I said, what's the difference between the two? I don't know. I said, but here's my problem. Why aren't there any cavemen ghosts? Yeah. Well, 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 what happened to the people that were here a million years ago? Mm -hmm. So these are the revelations. Everything is created according to our own perception. We see what we desire to see. That's why two people talking about an accident won't see it the same way. You know, they'll say that, you know, witnesses always give diverse uh, descriptions. Yes. We always see it through our own perception, our own belief. And, of course, at the same time, what we're thinking about at the moment of the occurrence of whatever it is, what the day's been like, whether we're hot, whether we're hungry, whether we're cold, it's all going to filter in and play a part in our witnessing of whatever is going on. So when you say, why don't we see cavemen? It's because of the belief that spirits are supposed to look like this. (laughs) Turn it. (laughs) Every time, you know, I used to teach professional sales and my first experiment when we got a group and our our groups were typically, we like to keep them under 30. Mm -hmm. And what I would do is get everyone into a conference room And I would simply write down the following. I would tell the person to read the note, and the note would say this. There was a car that sped by, and a dog was almost hit. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I said, now I want you to repeat that story to the person next to you. Mm-hmm. And I would go to the very last person. By the time the story reached to me, holy crap. I mean, this was a, a major deal. You know, it was a, a, a red Corvette that came by. And I mean, yeah. yes, <laughs> no one saw it as the same thing. They saw what they saw inside. Right, exactly. And so I'd like to get on because this has just been a fabulous time. So understanding that we are the I am. Now, when I first read that, I had to immediately break myself of a long held memory because I remember that distinctly being said of a particular God who called himself Yahweh. He said, I am. Right. And the reason why it is such a blasphemous term to use yourself in the first person of saying I am in capital letters is that because you're assuming yourself to be God. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm sure and you never heard that before. Oh, no, of course not. <laughs> no. <laughs> One of the reasons I, I took off the, the, the ability for people to make comments on all my YouTubes. So somebody sent me, somebody, <laughs> yeah, it was so funny. Somebody sent me, because you can still email people. From, you know. Yeah. Somebody sent me an email saying, oh, you're such a coward. You won't, you're saying things, but you won't let us comment back. You won't let anybody really see you. And I thought, oh, who is this? So I clicked on the person's channel, and instead of a picture of them, they had a cartoon. <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, are we talking about ourselves? <laughs> people oh. become very upset when you threaten a belief that they've held for a long time because if somebody says, okay, I agree with you about that, then what does that say about their other beliefs? I have people in my life who are steadfast uh, physicians, lawyers, people who, and they're not my students, they're just people in my life, people who are in mm-hmm. the business world and have protocols that they live by, et cetera, et cetera. And they do not want to talk to me about any of this. It's kind of like we just agree to not discuss any of this because if I shake up one of those pillars of that very strongly held assembly of something, what's going to happen to the rest of it? And I understand well, that. It's quite amazing to me that the death threats that I get are only from the Christian world. <laughs> now, I have Muslims, I have Hindus, I have uh, several Buddhists that write me, and they write in a form, uh, particularly, I'm I'm just going to say this, the Muslim friends, they are not this, you know, hellfire, you're going to get your ass thrown out, Steiger, you know, you might as well cash your ticket in, Yeah. (laughs) you know, Uh, they're actually more in tune to ask, well, how did you arrive here? Mm -hmm. And so getting back to what, basically what we're saying, that's a radical step from departure of most people's belief systems. Oh, it is. We have a um, farmer's market here on island that lasts from May to September. And year before last, my partner, Philip, uh, said, let's do the farmer's market. And I said, okay, Uh, that's a pretty big commitment. That's every Saturday. And on the holidays, it's Saturday and Sunday, like on July 4th. For all those months, you really want to do this? He goes, yeah, I really do. So we got banners made and we bought tables and cloths and all the stuff and the, the tent that you need to sit in your little eight by eight square. Uh, and um, he makes um, door no- uh, not doorknobs, but um, pull knobs for furniture out of rocks. Oh, Beach stones are gorgeous. So he sold those. He does fine jewelry. He casts fine jewelry. He sold that. And I put out my books. I put out my CDs and just we went and we did it. And it, it was it was kind of fun. It was a one summer's experience that I probably won't do again. But it was not. It was nice to be out in the, just the general public because Lopez Island has been declared a national uh, monument. So in the summer, people flock here by the thousands. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, so there's all these people here for it starts at ten, lasts till two, so for four hours. And there's all kinds of food, so everybody's eating and doing all these things. I just created a little dialogue to say to people when they stopped at my table. Um, they'd look at my books, look at my CDs, and I had some pamphlets of my work. And I would say to the person, do you have a specific uh, belief that you follow? Is there a spiritual belief in your life? The people who said no 
the people who said, well, I do yoga, but that's about it. Either they were just not interested and they just walked on, or a lot of them just stayed and talked for quite a while. The people who were Christian or Catholic, without exception, would get in my face and say, yes, I have a belief. It's Jesus Christ. (laughs) Peace, man. (laughs) And I thought, the first time it happened, I thought, well, I was having a bad day. The second time it happened, I went, okay. The third time, it was like, all right. People feel like they have to defend their faith. Yes, yes. Instead of just saying, yes, Jesus Christ is my Savior. Um, May I talk to you about him or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean... It's it, in a certain way, it's sad because each of those, just like my Catholicism and your Christianity and Catholicism for a little piece, mm-hmm. um, led you to where you are. Yeah. That's what's happening to everyone else. And it doesn't even mean that it has to happen in this lifetime, but it's one of the steps. I'm and grateful I, for what I absolutely. learned in that. It Absolutely. taught me the foundations of much of about the spiritual uh, walk. Yeah. It do- oh, absolutely. Yeah. And what you want to hold on to and use as uh, a support, if you would, and what you want to let go of. Mm-hmm. And in that is the invitation, because you can take your experience in the churches and apply it to your spiritual life and see which precepts actually make sense. And yes. which ones are just control mechanisms. Yes. You know what I learned when I really, and I'm still awakening. I mean, I live in a wonder. Uh, uh, I tell people all the time, I live in awe hmm. because it's, it's amazing. But here's the thing that's changed in me, Tony. I no longer live up to other people's expectations. Right. And it took a lot of self-discipline for me to finally tell people, I'm not here to live up to your expectation or your perception of reality. Right. So if you get mad, get mad at yourself. Yeah. Don't get mad. Yeah, yeah definitely. But, but that, see, that's hard for people to do. And that it's hard because they're afraid of being cast out. It, it yeah. literally is cellular memory, Wayne. It goes back to our time in the tribes. Yeah. That you were beginning of cavemen. Yeah. If you didn't do what you needed to do to fulfill your role in the tribe, you were left behind for the wolves. You know, I had a friend who told me when I said, listen, I, I've done my work. I understand how this story got told. I'm not, I'm rejecting it. You know what he told me? He says, you're going to be ostracized. He says, you're going to be basically, no one's going to talk to you. No one's going to call you. And do you know what? Damn it. He was trite. Mm-hmm. It, it, we had many, many Christian friends. Mm-hmm. Not one today will talk to me. You know what they've been told? Right. That I am a danger to the Christian faith. Right. Then that's true because you are. And if, if they, they, and then friends of theirs, and then friends of theirs move away from the church, whatever church it is, who's going to be supporting the church? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's really where it comes from. Because if it was a belief that was all-encompassing, which if you actually do read the Bible the way Jesus actually supposedly talked, and who knows if it's true, that was not the message. The message was all inclusive. The message was everyone. Everyone is invited. Everyone yeah. Can come. Yeah. And it doesn't have anything to do with trying to support an organization. No, no. And you know, you know what I told my friend? I said, you know what? I was born alone. I'm going to die alone. Yeah. I said, so this is good practice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I tell people now. Listen, I have seen the other side. I don't tell people this, Tony, and I can't describe it mm-hmm. because I can't describe something that I haven't seen before. Mm-hmm. But I know this, it's not a place of fear. No. That I do know. Yeah. And I sense that in much of the way, and this is what I get, I get the feeling so often I'm in a cocoon. Mm-hmm. 
is what I see. And um, maybe that's how it really is. I don't know. Well, it will be how you believe it is going to be. Yeah. The best example I saw of this was Robin Williams' old movie, What Dreams May Come. Yes. That really showed how everything was, how he expected it to be. And it, it just kept morphing and changing. The people changed. They changed personalities. They changed who they were for him, to assist him. I have told people this. And when I found out how Don Knotts left, he left laughing. <laughs> His wife was in tears. His daughter had walked out because she was laughing. And she says, I was cramping so bad, she said. And when I walked back in, he had, he had moved on. And I, it said something to me. And you know what? This is how I'm going to view it. I don't know what to expect, but I got to say this. It's been one far out ride. Yeah. I grew up, I got to see the bands. I was a roadie. I got okay. to see the superstars. Yeah. I, I got to go places with Timothy Leary that I was never would have ever gone before. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, the, the experiences, and I'm just going to have a big smile on my face. <laughs> That's a beautiful way to go. Well, I, I, I think that what we, we, and this is just me again, Tony, is that I think so often our culture focuses so much on life that we don't talk enough about death. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we live each moment understanding that death is just the portal, mm -hmm. that life then becomes so much more enriched. Right. And as I tell my students again, the people who have passed in your life are now closer to you than they were in your life, no matter who they were, no matter how close you were, husband, wife, father, mother, just you think you're just so close. They are closer now that they are not in body than you can even imagine. And yes. it's, it's such a gift. I have a friend who passed away a couple of years ago and she was critically ill. And we talked about this and I asked her if she would reach across and, you know, tickle me and say hi when she passed, you know, if, if she was willing to do that. And she said, yes. And I, and she said, but I don't know how, for what I do. And I said, well, I have found that technology is usually the easiest way to manipulate something, but you have to do it in such a way that I or another person can't put it off on, you know, a hoax or a virus or this or that. You're gonna have to do something that is demonstratively weird. So she goes, okay. So she passes and time goes by and I go to her memorial and there's her box of ashes sitting there and I put it in a position and I put a rose on top and it has her name on the plate and everything. And so I'm taking a picture of it with my iPhone. And after I took the picture, I couldn't touch my iPhone. It got so hot and the whole screen <laughs> turned bright red. I had to just drop it. And there was a techie guy there and I, and I knew, and I said, come here, what's going on? And he goes, I don't know, but don't get near it because it might explode. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, that's so and cool. Since then, she's done other things like change names on my screen. I'm looking at it, and then all of a sudden, the name changes. Like, oh, hi. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's so it's so fun. I mean, we can play with this. It doesn't have to be, you know, serious and morose. Ah, uh, Tony, you know that's 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 so what our species we need. This we're so lost, <laughs> and. You know, I don't know. I know that you and I and so many others uh, is even in the chat room and the others that will watch this. I think if you watch this, then you're amongst those that are that bright light that's mm -hmm. beginning to shine. Mm -hmm. And I hate using, you know, cliches, but we are becoming, you know, the million lights. The, uh, in fact, this is very interesting, Tony. I'm going to be doing a video on this that the fastest growing segment of the world population are people like us. I read that somewhere. Yeah. yeah. It's actually a news article. I yeah. Found it. We're in the, did you know we're over a billion? Yeah. I, I went, holy crap, a billion. We made the club, darling. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
we're going to do this. And, you know, I love what you bring. And I know, could we go a couple minutes over? I know that uh, if we don't have a hard stop down, uh, time, but I'd like to discuss a little bit more because I think, again, what your message brings is that message of awareness. Mm -hmm. And what I get is such a strong, positive energy, just from our conversation alone here, that it helps people to shed off that cloak of what I call the heaviness yeah. of life that it's taught to us. Yes. And then the I am begins to shine. Right. And when I teach, and I have one testimonial up on my website already, and people have said this to me frequently, it just happened again the other day, I really am about no BS. Ooh. I am not going to pull any punches, and I'm not going to let you as the student sit there lost in your belief, you know, morose idea of what is going on. I will stop you. And I teach one-on-one -on -one. Uh, so far, and this one, I'm going to look more into this Zoom. I haven't really looked into it too much. I teach one-on-one -on -one through Skype. This is, this is really good. I try doing um, more than one person at a time, but you're, you get caught being tied to the person with the slowest bandwidth. Mm -hmm. And it, it was too difficult. So I just teach one-on-one. -on -one. And when people are talking and they say something that, obviously a belief that is not serving them. I just stop them and say, no, that's BS. That's not true. And we go, and then we just go from there. But because I know it myself, it's easy for me to see it when it's there versus some idea or philosophy that I have to remember or go look it up in a book. It is, it's who I am. And it makes it easier to teach people to go to that place within themselves because I have been there. I mean, I, I understand what they're saying, and we can change it, and we can make it be not just easier to live and more peaceful and joyful, but more of a state of awareness that you're talking about that allows people to become aware of their own divinity yeah. and, and to see with divine eyes, to literally see everything divinely. And that doesn't mean holy and sacred, and it doesn't mean putting on a robe and a halo. It just means seeing the oneness, the union of it all. Mm. I'm resonating with this because part of the thing that I'm grateful for my spiritual background is the fact that I began to get clues a long time ago mm -hmm. that if we're created in the image of the creator, then that means we are the creator. Yes. If I'm looking in the mirror, Tony, I'm looking at an image of who Wayne Steiger is. Mm -hmm. And anything that's made in the image beyond that is me. Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody wants to know what a Wayne Steiger looks like, that's what one looks like. Yeah. Like having a badge at a yeah. conference. This is, is. A this is a Tony. <laughs> this is it, man. <laughs> but that's not who we are. No. It's, it's simply what performance we're putting on on this very big improv stage where everything is improv. And you say one thing, which leads me to say that, and then somebody else does this, and then we do that. It's, it's unscripted. I, I know your people may laugh at this, but I've learned to talk to my body. I mean, I realize yeah. that it's temporal, but mm -hmm. I get along with it now. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, it's been a faithful companion. Mm -hmm. It's been a dear, dear friend closer to me than any person I've ever known. Yeah. I told it the other day when I was looking in the mirror. I said, you know, when I pass on, and I said, I take on my new form. I said, in this realm, you're always going to be my representative. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, that's a strange place to get in your head, but Tony, <laughs> it's fascinating. <laughs> and it's fun. I like to, to look at your, your uh, body like a, a car, a vehicle. And it's what you use to drive around in this dimension. And just like your car, you water it and you feed it and you wash it and you take care of it. You do the same thing with your body. Yeah. It takes you here and it takes you there and it does this and it does that. And it behaves as well as you take care of it. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It's not you any more than the car is you when you get in to drive to the grocery store. Ah, uh, I'll tell you. Well, I know we've gone over. Tell people how they get. I've left all of your contact information in the description below, but 
please let them know because this is going to go up for replay here right after you and I get finished mm -hmm. and let people know because I can see the comments. Um, people are really resonating with this. Oh, wonderful. The easiest way to reach me, because I, if I just say the words, it's hard to have to spell everything. I have a, a, a splash page that's youarsacred.com, just as, it's, as you, you would think it's spelled, Y-O-U-A-R-E sacred.com. If you go there, it's my, it lists my five websites with the top one being Sacred Spaces, my main website. Click on that, and over in the left-hand column, It'll say, you know, where you can contact me and you can email me and uh, people can get a hold of me that way. That's the easiest way. And you do work one-on-one. Uh, -on -one, yes. And I, I like the fact that you tell people straight out that you're not a counselor or a coach. No. And I make a big point of that on my website. I do not do counseling. I do not do coaching. And if you feel you need that, go to a person who does. If I'm working with a student and I begin to see signs of some issues, I have a few counselors that I send them to that work through Skype if they're not in the same city. And I'll just stop and say, okay, we're gonna stop here. I want you to contact this person, get some counseling and then come back to me. But I'm not going to go any further until this is taken care of and I'm not the person to do it. I get the sense as well, Tony, is that for you to work with a person, they have to be very seriously committed. Or at least want to spend the time to see if they can make the commitment. Good, um, okay. Otherwise, what happens is they enroll in a course, they pay me for it, I send them the material, we get started, and then they um, don't get back to me. And they don't get back to me. And I, and I pay attention to all my students. I, if I don't hear from you in quite a while, I'll email you and say, hello, checking in. <laughs> <laughs> and some people will just stop. They'll just say, and I'll say, fine, don't continue now. Wait until you're ready to continue. You've got the material and I'm still here. And we'll just pick up wherever you left off. Those are few and far between. Most people, by the time they come to me and make that commitment, are ready. Yes. I have students that I've worked with. In fact, one of my students just posted on Facebook the other day. It's been eight years. And she said how she felt about me, which was very sweet. And a lot of my students just stay with me for a very long time. I can see why. I'm constantly creating new courses, yeah. new ways of looking at things, and new ways of doing things. I just uh, recently started doing virtual retreats, which are just yummy. Well, I'd like to get more of this because I'll tell you, um, your message resonates with me. I think it resonates with a lot of people. And it's just that people have to get over this fear yeah. that of breaking tradition, breaking the taboo, mm -hmm. that you are in fact divine. And let's rise, raise above just saying you're divine. Understand you are the creative force within the universe. And Tony, that's what I get. Yes, that, that yeah. is what we're doing. We're creating our own universe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope you will come back on. Oh, I would love to, Wayne. Okay. I have just got to get you on the Friday night show, and that way we can really just um, get some people out. And I'd like to invite you on to the radio show. It has a uh, much broader uh, international audience. This is a message that I can hitch up my uh, horse to. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'd love to do that. It's an easy expression in the South. All right, folks. Well, hey, I appreciate all of you. Thank you, the moderators. Uh, is not Tony just wonderful? Reverend Dr. Tony, I mean, thank you for coming on. Um, folks, you know, there is hope for our species. When I see people like Tony that have this message that is one of beauty, it's freedom, and more than anything else, it's what I call a refreshing newness. And I, I, Tony, I just love it. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful. All right, folks, we'll see you again real soon. Be good to each other. Tony, stay with me as we get out. And folks, thanks a lot. Y'all be good. Bye-bye.